If you're joining us today, and I'm pleased to see a few new kind of visiting faces today, uh, we are in kind of a three-week mini-series on the Ten Commandments that we're calling Upward, Inward, Outward, taking last week to look at the commandments in regards to our relationship with God. We are taking today to look inward on the fourth commandment of Sabbath rest, and next week uh, we will look at our our response, the, the outward, the last six commandments, um, our response to what God is doing in our life. Um, so as I did, la- or as Michelle did last week, I want to read the section in Deuteronomy uh, regarding the Ten Commandments. So we're going to look about the first 21 verses. Feel free to, uh, there are Bibles uh, next to you. I do think it's a different one that I'm going to be reading, but uh, you can still follow along and it should be up on the screen. Um, So, chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. Moses called all the people of Israel together and said, Listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations I am giving you today, so you may learn them and obey them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our ancestors, but with all of us who are alive today. At the mountain, the Lord spoke to to you face to face from the heart of the fire. I stood as an intermediary between you and the Lord, for you were afraid of the fire and did not want to approach the mountain. He spoke to me, and I passed his words on to you. This is what he said. Verse 6, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any gods, other gods but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey me, obey my commands. Verse 11, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All... Your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with a strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Verse 16, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's wife. You must not covet covet your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to what you have to teach to us today. Just thank you for this opportunity to be here amongst church family today, God. We just give this day to you. And we say all this in your name. Amen. All right. Well, with a small church, we can, uh, we can interact in ways that maybe big churches can't. So a little uh, Q&A. And just if you have an answer, shout it out. If you don't, just stare at me awkwardly and I'll get the hint. Why are we so tired? Why are we always so tired? Work. Being overworked. Dogs. Animals. Yeah. Avoiding work, actually, I've realized, too. Anything else? Stress. stress? Was, all right. I heard two stresses. That means it's definitely true. <laughs> Kids, for me, it's a two-year-old queen of the house, right? They're like, who's the queen of your house? It is not Rachel. It is, it is Clara. Right now, she runs the household. Kids, parents, let's be real. Parents can be. Anything else? Being overcommitted. Are you trying to convict me of something right now? Because that, that one hit the heart. That's, that's absolutely me. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. When is it? Oh, it's Sunday at 2. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. When is it? Sunday at 2.15. Yeah, that'll work, right? And we, that's what we do. We, we can't say no. So, 
yeah, we wake up tired. We, we go to bed tired. We, we go to work tired. And some things that we seek rest in, we get even more tired. Michelle walked in and asked me how I'm doing. And I was like, well, same day, different story. And that story is I'm tired. And I blame Clara, right? I don't really blame her, but we're just, we're tired. And I was thinking about that a lot, right? We're talking about this idea, the fourth commandment, Sabbath rest. And I was thinking, I try to do that every now and then. And our culture, I personally think, thinks that rest is weird. I think rest is weird to our culture. You take out rest, you put words like inefficient, unproductive. I think there's aspects of culture that think rest is weak, right? That the, the rest isn't something that uh, we need. And our world thrives on going and growing. And, and rest does not appear to help with that, right? You can't keep going if you're stopping. Or something else I was thinking of, we're constantly working from behind, right? We feel uh, overwhelmed, we get behind, we stop whether we like to or not, and then we have to play catch up. And we can't seem to catch up, and pausing and resting just seems to be a little irrational. If I have to get to point B, I can't get there if I stop at point A, I was thinking about it a little more, and Matthew 6, 24 seems to ring quite true of our culture's pursuit of this going, going, going. Matthew 6 says this, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and you will love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Very clear. He doesn't say, all right, yeah, good luck finding that balance. You can have your cake and eat it too. He says, you will serve, you will be devoted to one and you will despise the other. Not you will forget the other or you'll get around to the other, but you will despise. Now, one more crowd interaction pop quiz. Which master has our culture chosen? We have this pursuit of, of money, right? We've, we've chosen money and we pursue money, but we can never have enough money, so we never stop pursuing and we become tired. Now, I'm not saying that's everybody in this room, but to say our culture doesn't have this desire to serve money, the, the culture around us that we can sometimes get immersed in, it totally does. In my studying, I came across this term that's become quite relevant in Japan over the past uh, decade or so. It's this term called karoshi, and it, it's a Japanese word that literally means death by overwork. And it became prominent in Japan when there were multiple, like several cases coming up, uh, similar to a death of a journalist named Miwa Sato in 2013. So he was a journalist that had just gotten done covering two elections back to back, going, going, going. And one day she just dropped dead. It said that she put in approximately 150 hours of overtime in one month. Now, mind you, if you work a standard nine-to-five job, right, four weeks in a month, you're doing approximately 160 hours of work in a month. Now, some of you are saying, 160, that's it. That might be part of the problem, right? So uh, this journalist essentially doubled that amount of work in a month. The World Health Organization uh, in 2021, attributed almost three-quarter of a million, so 750,000 deaths were attributed to overwork. Now, that's a really broad umbrella, but what you're seeing is a lot of chronic stress, right? And it, it leads to our body holding on to these hormones that wear down our circulatory system. I was looking at a lot of these, because just to say people died of overwork is a little too general. But often, overwork will lead to these uh, symptoms and all comes back down to our circulatory system wearing down. The other uh, avenue, sadly, would be suicide, right? Working too much, feeling overwhelmed, no way out, death by suicide. But a lot of these, our bodies just literally break down. Some of these stories, I don't know if they were embellished at all, but they said some of these journalists in Japan, that was often one of these deaths that was attributed to overwork. They still had their pen and paper in hand when they keeled over. Again, that might just be theatrics and flair for the story, but it got me thinking. In a go, go, go world, we have to understand that we have bodies that stop, 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 right? Humans were born, we have limits. Our physical bodies are finite, right? They have a point of exhaustion. 
we are meant to and we are expected to get tired. I think of the words in Isaiah chapter 40, very, very popular. It says, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. Again, the words that are being attributed to us, weak, powerless, tired, exhausted. In verse 31, though, it says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So those who trust in the Lord will find new strength, which means that's not strength that I currently have unless I am seeking the Lord. When we operate in our own power, we grow weak. We grow tired. We grow exhausted, powerless. But when we operate as a part of God's design for us, we run, we don't grow weary, we find new strengths. And a a part of that design, I believe, is to take rest. I don't think this is a uh, new information, but God knows us, right? He created us and he knows us. And he knows that one thing we humans like to do is identify ourselves with what we do. It's so common to us, right? Looking back in the first page of the Bible, Adam comes out, and in the same sentence, he is given a a duty. It says this in verse 15 in Genesis, the Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So Adam's created, and immediately he has a duty. He has something to do. He has responsibility. What's one of the first questions you ask somebody if you're in a social gathering, right? Oh, hi, what's your name? And then, oh, what do you do? Or what did you do if you're retired? It's, it's in our nature to associate people with what they do. Oh, yeah, this is my wife, Rachel. She's a teacher. My mom told me something pretty interesting. She's a mother of three boys. And she said that whenever she introduced herself with pride, she'd immediately say, hi, my name's Kathy, I'm Tim's mom, or whatever son that she was kind of in that environment with, she'd say, oh, I am their mom. It was in her nature to identify who she is with what she does. She was proud to be a mom, sometimes not so proud to be some of her moms given the circumstance, right? Oh, I don't know whose kid that is, right? But she was so proud that she would associate with what she did. And she was a mom of three awesome kids. Not always awesome. We tried. But God knows that what we do is intimately attached to who we are. He knows that we will, if allowed, we will work till we are satisfied. But he knows that we are never satisfied so that we will just keep working until we break down. God knows us, and God knew the Israelites who he was giving these commandments to. And he knows that they were a nation that was held in captivity. So uh, their, not just their livelihood was attached to work, but if they couldn't work, their, their existence in Egypt was attached to work. You were only valuable if you could work. If you couldn't work, you would probably disappear. So that's who he's talking to. Uh, He's talking to a nation that is not familiar with this idea of rest. It wasn't even on the table. And uh, to do or to work was attached to their existence. Which is exactly why after the first three commandments of being very clear with where God needs to be on our priority list, he then says, you must take a full day where you are to cease from your work. You would take a full day to stop what you so intimately are attached to and reflect on me. Dedicate a whole day to celebrating, honoring, and remembering who I am to you. Flash forward to now in our human nature, right? It's in our our flesh to to rebel against God's uh, creation, to, to rebel against what God created us to do, and that's to rebel against rest. I think we are sent lie after lie after lie in an attempt to prevent us to rest. And so uh, today, I'm going to look at three things, right? Lies against the Sabbath, and then the purpose of Sabbath rest, and ultimately our ultimate Sabbath rest, which is with Jesus. So during this journey, I want us to remember this one thing, and maybe if this is all you take home, Awesome, because I think when I contemplate this, it it really hits hard. Sabbath rest will reveal who we are and remind us of 
who God is. It can be dangerous because Sabbath rest will reveal who we are, right? What we're doing, maybe areas of unhealthiness in our lives, but it will remind us of who God is. And, and real quick, if this idea of Sabbath is completely foreign to you, what it would look like now is uh, a 24-hour period. Now, not to get legalistic, but a day is, is your goal, but just a period of rest that you dedicate to uh, saying no to work, but yes to life-giving time that you are honoring to God. Getting out in nature, spending time with your family, things that will essentially fill your cup. A full day's rest of that. And we'll get into that more, but I just, as I was going, there might be some of us that are like, what is this? Isn't that the name of a, a band back in the day, right? Um, so, lies against the Sabbath. First one is that rest equals laziness. To be restful is to be lazy. It's pretty interesting that a lot of, uh, I was reading this commentary and they pointed out something that I hadn't quite realized. A lot of uh, Jesus' clash, clashes with uh, the Pharisees actually happened on the Sabbath day. And it said this, as you're reading, these clashes happened so much that when you said, and on the Sabbath day, when you read that, you knew something bad was going to happen between Jesus and the religious leaders. So even they struggled to understand what this Sabbath rest should look like uh, when Jesus came to this earth. And I think we struggle with the idea of being, uh, having rest means being lazy when we think of rest outside of the work rhythm, right? When we think, all right, I got work and I got rest, but we f don't like pause to think that maybe rest is actually a healthy part of that work rhythm. It's like thinking of the creation story as six days and not seven, right? Now, he, he created the world in six days, but that seventh was very crucial, it was a part of creation story as a whole. It was the day that he blessed it, and he made it holy, and his work was complete. The reality is, is that rest is a part of a balanced life. You work, you play, you sleep, you rest. I was reading studies on, on people that tried to break the record, which I'm all about encouraging someone to break a record, but one record I'm never going to try and break is staying awake for the most days ever. And the record's at like 11 and a half days. And the reports were, I think the last time this was challenged was like in the 1960s, and it was a 17-year-old young man who broke the record. And they said, oh, he was fine, pretty solid for the first week or so. But right around day 10 and 11, physically, he was okay. But cognitively, he kind of got to be a mess. And they're like, yeah, it's fine. He just started experiencing some hallucinations or cognitive thinking. Like they asked him to count back from uh, 100 by 7, and he stopped at 65. And the reason he stopped is because he didn't know what he was doing. So uh, we push ourselves to this point of exhaustion where our brains start to fall apart. Sleep, physical sleep, is a psych psychological necessity, right? Our body, even though our brains aren't completely shutting down, our bodies need that. I know for me in this time where um, obviously sleep looks a little different, that was one of the hardest things about parenthood, knowing that uh, before Clara, I had a pretty strong chance that I was going to be able to sleep eight or nine hours uninterrupted. And that was a mental game to realize that, okay, I'm going to get interrupted a few times during my sleep. But still, after I'm exhausted from just life or being with their laying down my tired legs, I know that they are getting the rest they need, right? That cup is getting filled so I can be prepared to do it the next day. And the goal with rest, again, is to uh, be in a state of relaxation. It's a part of our balanced life. And I know that you guys are reflecting back on your life where you've had those, we've all had those crazy work weeks, right? Where we work eight days out of the week or where we've burnt the midnight oil. And no one after those periods of time is like, I am ready immediately to do it again. It's, I'm calling to see where a hotel is on the coast or somewhere so I can get out of here. We need rest. Our bodies desire rest. Another lie is I'll sleep when I die. Oh, I'll sleep when I die. And I, I think that first lie, rest equals lazy, that's an external view. I think that's a view uh, that our society kind of puts on us. So flipping it around, I think this is an internal view. I'll sleep when I die. Code for there is just too much to do. That's correct. 
There is too much to do. Out here in Sunny Valley, I know that's something that's hard to combat. I know a lot of you guys uh, own several acres of property, maybe multiple properties, uh, a lot of animals, right? A lot of farms, a lot of ranches. There is just so much to do. And there is a fact that there is always something to do. In the ministry world, I learned this pretty quick. There is always somebody that needs help. In this world that is falling, it is crashing quick, it is broken, there is always somebody that needs help. I could, if I wanted and if I had endless energy, pick a person an hour for 24 hours of a day and then run it back and get a new person for a new hour and never run out of needs. The problem is, is that I'm forgetting one very important person's needs, and that's myself. It's very easy to neglect ourselves to help others. But it's a fact of life. There's always something to do, and there's always a need. But just because there's always roads to be driven on doesn't mean that our cars need to be the one always driving on it. There's only uh, one way that needs are going to get addressed, and that is through healthy laborers. Not just laborers, but healthy laborers. And those laborers, us, we need rest. Another lie, trying to move through these pretty quick. Uh, to have Sabbath rest means to veg. All right, to have Sabbath rest means to veg. I think I've talked about this before, but as I learned about this idea of Sabbath rest, it was on a Friday. And uh, Rachel would go to work. This was pre-Clara. And I would grab Carl's Jr. and I'd watch a few movies. Right? I would just kick back, not even get out of my PJs. Showering was optional. It was great. And Rachel's going to work. She's like, all right, I know when I come back, I'm going to have a healthy, refreshed Tim, and we're going to go on a walk, and we're going to talk, and we're just going to have a great Friday night. And she'd get back, and I'd be like, oh, well, I'm still really tired. I think I need some more rest. I think I actually need to try and rest because I wasn't rejuvenating my soul. I was actually filling my body with unhealthy food, and then I was uh, watching a movie that was not really doing anything for me, but I was, I was being uh, lazy. This idea of vegging, so there's vegging versus Sabbath. To be, have Sabbath rest is to be really intentional, but to veg is to actually avoid responsibility, right? To not worry about that stuff, to ignore it. It doesn't go away. It just is going to get pushed off. But to have Sabbath rest is to be intentional. Three quick ways to be intentional with your Sabbath rest, to have rhythm, to be refreshed, and then to reorient. To have a ryth rhythm of Sabbath rest, actually your Sabbath starts seven days away. right? The whole, the whole goal is to be diligent and be productive in your work week so that there's nothing kind of on your mind in your Sabbath rest. That's ideal, not always realistic. But it's not putting stuff off so you can rest, but it's actually being intentional with your work, with the, the time the good Lord gave you to work, to then enjoy your rest. Sabbath is uh, to find things that are refreshing. Again, that's going to look different for each and every one of us. For some of you, that's going on a hike by a river. Uh, for others, maybe that's meeting up with somebody uh, that is just very life-giving to you. For some of us, it's not answering that call with the person that we know is going to maybe drain our emotions. And that's, that's okay. That's actually something that's hard to realize, but that's okay. Again, life or death emergencies, that's an exception. But life giving things only. For me, it's spending time with family. And the third part to be intentional is, like I said, reorienting. What can we say no to? For me, it was a big reminder, life, believe it or not, actually goes on without me. When I say no to something, it's an opportunity for somebody else to say yes. Before we move on more to the purpose of Sabbath, there is a reality that you will Sabbath, whether it is intentional or not. Our bodies will find rest. It's kind of up to us, though, if we enter into that time of rest or if we are entered into that time of rest. And I think of all the times where I've just worked hard, hard, hard. People are like, Tim, you need to take a break. Take a break. No, no, no. Devil doesn't take a day off. Neither am I, right? Go hard, go hard, go hard. Well, what happens? Pneumonia, strep throat twice, the flu, something. My body says I am breaking down. We get sick. And so I'm sitting on the couch, 
recovering. I said, all right, the rest found me this time. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 36, if you ever want to read the story. Um, there was a, a king of Jerusalem, and he was evil in God's sight, and he didn't, uh, didn't honor what the Lord had put before him. So Jerusalem was sacked by Babylon, and any, any survivors were taken into exile. But it's fascinating, at the very end of this story, verse 21, it says, the land finally enjoyed its rest. See, the, the Sabbath was even meant uh, for the lands and the farmlands to have a season where they would actually rest and not be worked on. But this king was not honoring what the Lord had, so there was constantly this work. And so they got sacked, and they were sent into exile, and it says the land finally enjoyed its rest. Again, our bodies and our minds and our, our souls and our spirits, they will rest, whether we are intentional about it or not, but it is in our favor to be intentional with our rest. So we enter now into the purpose of the Sabbath, and again, it's to reveal who we are, what we're doing, what we, maybe we need to recalibrate, and remind us of who God is. If you've done any study of Leviticus, our church went through it a few years ago, you're familiar with the festivals that the Israelites celebrated. It's something that we've definitely talked about. There's about a half dozen, and they combined essentially, and I'm, I'm summarizing greatly, to relay two messages from the Israelites. Some of the festivals had this theme of thank you, God, and some of these festivals had this theme of we need you, God. But ultimately, those festivals would relay one of those two things, thank you, God, for what you've done, we need you, God. Many of these festivals that had this we need you God tone all had something similar in them, and that was this idea of Sabbath rest. One specifically was the Festival of Trumpets had two things, rest and holy assembly. Holy assembly, sorry. So I'm just it's us getting together, having a big old potluck, being together and resting. Not talking work, not working at all, rest and holy assembly. The Festival of Trumpets began their civil year as kind of a, a New Year's vibe. And it said that trumpets would be sounded all day, uh, representing the calling in of the workers, right? So that was the representation, that these trumpets are blaring, calling in the workers. We are no longer working. We are done. The message was simple. Hey, come in and do no work. I give you rest. You are able to rest with each other. The Sabbath rest amidst these festivals was uh, a reminder of the mercy that God, God had on the Israelites. Again, if, if you were an Israelite and you had memories or you heard stories of slavery in Egypt, one thing you wouldn't hear is the story of rest. So it's weird to think about. A lot of us, rest is something that we dream about or maybe something that our lives avoid. But to the Israelites, this idea of rest was a foreign concept. It was not a part of their DNA. It was not something that they did. So these festivals, they highlighted God's mercy through rest. And honestly, that's probably one of God's most underrated qualities is the mercy that he gives us through rest. I think of Jesus' words in Matthew. They're going to be said again here in a few minutes. But he says, take my yoke upon you and I will find rest for your souls. And God's mercy and Jesus' mercy, rest is for us. Rest is available to us. I would say of the Ten Commandments nowadays, this is the one that maybe lends itself to the most controversy, right? There's actually no New Testament command demanding that we uh, practice the Sabbath rest, but it's still a principle that is uh, affirmed in the New Testament. But I want to look at the purpose of the Sabbath rest then and now. Back then, the, the rest was to stop and cease. Again, it was a reorienting of the Israelites to stop, because I know that work is all you know. Work is how you identify yourself, so you're going to stop that to, to remember who I am. Remember how you got here. Uh, rest was a covenant sign. Again, remember the, the Israelites. God said, be holy, be set apart, uh, for you are my people. Be holy, because I am holy. So this idea of rest that would have been in, uh, pretty foreign to a lot of the surrounding cultures, 
uh, would be a sign that they are in covenant with God. I was reading this. It said, in the Babylonian creation stories, the gods are freed from their labors after the creations of humans who were formed for the sole purpose of serving the deity's needs. Again, some of these surrounding cultures. God's Sabbath, however, is not an aversion or avoidance to labor, but the celebrative cessation of completed work. So back then to the Israelites, Sabbath would have been to stop and to cease what you are doing so you can reflect on what God has done for you in Egypt. But for now, for us in 2023, I think entering into a time of Sabbath rest, we reflect on the redemption that we have in Jesus. We're on this side of the cross. We actually uh, get to experience the redemption and reflect on what Jesus did for us on the cross. When Jesus told the religious leaders that you must love the Lord with all, uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, as I talked about last week, I, I truly believe he meant it. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. So it makes sense that as we enter into a Sabbath rest, we need to find rest for our hearts and our souls and our minds along with our body. The time of Sabbath rest, again, for some of us, maybe it's a, uh, 24 hours, a lot of pastors will do like a Friday night to a Saturday night, right? Phones go off, phones go away. People are told to call somebody else. Maybe it's a full day for you, but you rest your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the goal is for you to enjoy, enjoy what the Lord has has brought you, to delight and not to be burdened. And it's hard when you think of Sabbath rest. I, I think lies of selfishness come in, right? You can't do that. Why would you? Do, why do you think you can do that? We are called to to seek rest and to reflect on the redemption that we have in Jesus. Another purpose of the Sabbath it's an identity check. I've been saying it right. It's a reminder of of who we are and, and what God has done for us. It's a good time to actually stop, and it might be the only period of reflection that we have all week. But it's good to look at, all right, what am I doing? What are all the tasks I have? What are all the commitments I have? What are all the relationships that I have? Asking yourself some serious questions. Are they healthy? Are are they glorifying to the Lord? That alone is going to be a lot of brain work. But I think that committing to a day of rest and a day removed from work-related activities, it'll reveal the anxieties and the stressors that we didn't know have control over us. For me, when I would enter into a day of rest and I I made the boundary of answering no work calls or work texts, and when I'd actually done my job and and, and done all of my my duties that I I needed throughout the week, and I'd get a call from somebody for work, I'd get get stressed out. Oh my gosh, they need something, they need me, they need Tim, 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 they need me. What are they gonna do if I don't answer? The weird answer was they they moved on. They solved the problem themselves. But I realized that work, and again, it's hard because it's ministry-related work, had such a control over who I was. But again, the Sabbath rest reminds us of who we are and what God did for us and who we are as children of God, right? Right? John 1 says this, we all, all who believe and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. I am a worker, I am a pastor by vocation, and that is my life that I have dedicated to, and ministry of the gospel of Jesus is what I pledge my life to, but ultimately I am a child of God, and I must find time to rest and delight in who he is. And with that, a time uh, to reflect on God's holiness. I think this needs to be a part of our Sabbath rest, right? Four things. One, what God did in Genesis. It's a great time for us to enjoy God's creation. Again, some of you guys on your rest, you might go out in creation and, and nature, delight in his work. It's really important. To the Israelites, number two, it was important to delight in what God did in Egypt, to reflect on God's rescue. For us, delighting in God's power. Looking back on things that have happened, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back on what the Lord did, even though I didn't want Him to, right? The delighting in the answer, the the answered prayer, and then the unanswered prayer. 
delighting in God's power. Number three, what God did on the cross. Again, the redemption of Jesus. Delighting in his grace. I know there's some stories in here. Before you met Jesus, there were some wild, wild stories. Again, none of us are perfect after meeting Jesus. We've still made mistakes, but if we all got together, our collective list of mistakes is pretty intense. But it's so cool to know that Jesus looked at that list and he took it to the cross for us. None of you are too far gone, right? None of you are too far gone. You are my children. And the last one, number four, is what God is doing now through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's finding spiritual rest in Jesus. Again, the verse I referenced in Matthew 11, if our worship team wants to come back up as we're kind of getting down to the end here, it says, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I want to pause because I know each and every person has some sort of heavy burden. There's that, that part of our back and our neck right here is always stressed and it's tight and it's tense because we carry a lot. It says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. So Jesus is our ultimate Sabbath rest. I think, again, our lives before Jesus where we toiled and and guilt and shame and we wandered looking for temporary rest, things that would fill that void, and they never would. I want us to reflect on the life that we have in Jesus. I think of his words on the cross, it is finished. He took that to the cross for us. And we're still going to get tired, right? Our bodies get tired, and that is okay because Jesus is our rest. God works in our work, and God works in our rest as well. I want to end with this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Let's pray. Lord, we, we boast in you. We boast in your work. We boast in your power. We take joy in knowing that you are there in the times that we are weak and the times that we can't. We take delight in knowing that you are here for us. We thank you for this day. Uh, Again, Lord, I thank you for all of the fathers, the father figures in here uh, that are just continuing uh, to pour into younger generations to what it means to be a, a man that follows you with their heart. We just give this day to you and we say all this in your powerful name. Amen.